Have you ever wondered if the SAT is curved? Or if so, how that curve works? The College Board likes to say the SAT isn't curved, it's scaled. But what does that mean exactly? I'm gonna talk about how the SAT is scaled and what that means for you as a test taker in terms of testing strategy. If you're wondering who I am, my name's Brooke. I've been tutoring and teaching the SAT and ACT for over a decade and a half. I have coached students to perfect scores on both tests. In fact, I just had a student who's on our online ACT course just email me this last week and say he got a perfect 36, which is super awesome. If you wanna know how he did it, check out supertutortv.com. That's where you will find the best SAT prep course ever and the best ACT prep course ever. We also have books for the ACT, the best ACT math books ever, which you can find on amazon.com, where I've packed all of my knowledge of ACT math to the best of my ability. We also have a totally free mailing list, supertutortv.com slash subscribe, and we will keep you in the know of anything awesome that we have going on here. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Come on, follow us, that would be awesome, at supertutortv. The SAT curve. What I'm gonna do in this video is first just talk about the SAT scale. Then I'm gonna get into some potential issues with it that some students have. And then I'm gonna talk about how the College Board does it and my opinion of whether it should be called a curve or not. So the idea behind scaling the SAT is that anytime the College Board creates a test, there are so many factors that go into creating that test, right? They wanna make it balanced. They wanna not have it like all be Algebra 2, right? It has to be some Algebra 2, some Geometry, like all these different factors that they're trying to balance in this test. So it's a really hard task to get all of these metrics aligned, right? And so then to get something that's perfectly as difficult as every other test, well, that can be hard to align too. So what's the solution? The solution that they've come up with is scaling exams. And what scaling exams does is it statistically says, hey, if you got this score on this exam that I'm giving you, or this many wrong on this exam, that's about the same as getting this many wrong on this exam statistically, right? There's always gonna be some variance. Everything's not always going to be perfect. If I sat you down and made you take like four SATs in a row, two or three days in a row, chances are your score would bounce around by 20 or 30 points, or maybe even 60 points on every test, right? Even if you're the same human being, same tests, and, and that's with one human being. But across the population, it's going to be, right, average or so. Now, obviously scaling isn't a perfect system. I see an issue in the sense that there are certain scenarios that favor certain groups over others, depending on whether you get a quote hard test, right? If you get a hard test, the test has an easy curve and that's always my favorite. Or you can get an easy test and then the test has a really damaging kind of curve and it's much less forgiving. So who is what good for? Well, a hard test with an easy curve is best for people who tend to make careless errors because if you're the kind of person who you know everything and there's never a time when you get something wrong because you don't understand the concept, but you just are like careless and you know, you put B on your worksheet and then you put C on your bubble sheet and you don't know why you do it. And that's like your struggle in life with standardized tests. If that's you, a hard test with an easy curve is going to be better. But an easy test with a hard curve is going to be better for people who generally don't make any careless errors, who are very careful about things, but maybe missing some content or don't actually know how to do some problems. And that's why they miss things. So it really depends on what kind of person you are. Also, like if you're aiming for a perfect score, an easy test is usually an easier way to get that, even if it has a horrible curve, like if you miss one and it's 30 points, right? Heck, if you can just get that one and it's easier to get, that would be a good test to try to get a perfect score on, right? So there's also some other pieces to this game. In any case, now what I wanna talk about is how does the College Board actually create this scale and where does it come from and is it a curve or are they just like using language to try to obfuscate what they're doing and try to prove to students that they're fair even though what they're doing may have some elements to it that, that are not completely statistically perfect. Well, the psychometric experts at the SAT first started developing the SAT scale back in 2014 before the new test was released. And they did that by taking a group of like 15,000 students at over 400 schools and sitting them down with a full length SAT, handing them a $50 gift card after they walked out and figuring out how did they score and how did they do, right? So that's how it all started. And a critique of the original scaling project was that it was all volunteers 
and these were not actual test takers. And even when the College Board initially released the test, it's the same deal. Nobody had taken the test for real when they put that first test out there. So there was some critiquing that went on that they weren't using the information from actual tests when they did this and that the people who were sitting there weren't very motivated to do well on these sections because, hey, they might just be in it for the gift card, right? In any case, that's kind of how they started off. Now they're basically using pre-testing. In 2019, the College Board universally started putting a fifth section on the SAT so that they could increase, I'm guessing, increase their sample size on these experimental items. And what that means is that test takers in the US, and I don't know if they're rolling this out internationally, some places or not, but generally most test takers in the US on a national test state have a fifth section of the SAT where they have 20 minutes to complete any number of items in either the writing and language reading or math sections of the exam where these untested items for which the College Board doesn't really have data on yet are put in front of students who are actually testing and these students are ambiguously told that it could count in their score so hopefully they're motivated to do them because College Board says that they have the right to not put the experimental questions there but then put the experimental questions in the middle of your test and then take your test questions and put them in the experimental section and mix them up who knows if they actually do that? I'm not sure. So what do they do with this data? Well, here's what they do. So after they do the pretest, they do three points of analysis on that. One thing and the most important thing that they're trying to figure out is how hard is each question. They turn that into what's called a p-value, which basically is what's the probability of somebody getting any individual question right or wrong, right? So most of the questions are gonna be hovering somewhere around the midline, like 50% of people get them right, 50% of people get them wrong. And there's variance. Obviously there's questions where 70% get them right, and that's gonna help them figure out the lower score band. And there's questions where 18 or 28% of people are getting them right. And then that's gonna help them determine really like the top band of scores, like who's getting much higher scores. The other things that they're looking at, they do an evaluation that is called a DIF analysis, which is like a difference analysis. And they're basically just trying to figure out are the questions biased, right? Do people in particular groups do better or worse? Right? Do people in the South do really well on this question because they understand some of the jargon? Do people who are suburban do better on this question because it talked about garage sales and, and kids who live in urban environments in Manhattan are like, what's a garage sale? And then the other thing that they're testing for, in addition to bias because of your demographics, they're also looking at item discrimination, which is the idea that like if a question is only gotten right by you know a small number of people, the people getting it right should be the people who are scoring the best on the test. It shouldn't be the people who are scoring the lowest. So if you had an item that like only 20% of test takers are getting right, and all the kids who are basically almost failing the SAT are the only ones who got it right, it's not really a good test question, so they're gonna throw that out. But then what happens is they basically assemble the test at that point, they're like happy with it, they're gonna assemble the test, and they're gonna administer the test. And then after you know hundreds of thousands of students go take the test in real testing conditions, they call that operational data, all the stuff they get back from all of you guys who take the test. And this is why it takes them a couple of weeks to get your score back if you're ever wondering, why don't they just give it to me the same day, right? Why don't they just turn that around? Well, it's because they're data crunching. So while they don't call this a curve, and a lot of the research does go on the front end so that they're pretty sure it's scaled pretty well, on the back end, there's still some work to do, right? One thing that can happen is there might be errors and those errors need to get corrected and they'll find problematic questions and maybe they get reports from someone and then those errors can get corrected. In any case, they potentially make changes at this point and that is where the, the information from the College Board gets murky. Exactly how much weight does that real world operational data have? Because if you think about it, there's also another piece of bias and that piece of bias is what date did you take the test on? I have personally found, and this is very anecdotal because I work with students one-on-one -on -one and it is what it is, but I have found anecdotally that the October exam, for example, I find to be harder for students to get a high score when we know sort of where they've been scoring on all their practice tests that are from all different months than say like a March test or a May test. And I would assume that's because of this reassessment of the operational data, because think about it, who's taking the test in October? People who take the test in October that I know of, one, are seniors, so they're older and potentially smarter. Two, they're also people who really care about their SAT score to the point that that's probably not their first take. I would guess in October, you have a lot more repeat test takers than in March, right? March is oftentimes the first test people take. By the time you get to October, 
you know, a couple people have taken it a couple times, everybody's trying to get a higher score, right? So that would make sense to me why October would be more competitive. The other thing that I say about October and competitiveness is the essay. Your essay is always at a pool with a bunch of seniors instead of a bunch of juniors. And that makes it potentially harder too, because like if you're an essay grader, you're supposed to have so many this ranking and so many that ranking. Obviously it's all supposed to be equal. But let's be honest, right? Like you're comparing things and that's the nature of the beast. And when you have humans doing the process. So is it a curve? Technically no, but is it a curve? Kind of, because some of the data that they're looking at does come after the fact and it is compared against the people that you actually took the test with. But in any case, there's my two cents. I hope you guys found this video helpful. If so, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Thanks for watching, you guys. If you're taking the test in a couple of weeks, good luck to you and check out a lot more of our videos because we've got plenty of tips here on our channel. Thanks for watching. Bye.